thank God. To say I'm relieved that my, my first post got through would be an understatement of massive proportions. Uh, even though it seems like not many people saw it, the fact anybody did is a blessing in itself. It gives me hope that all of us might make it out of the situation yet. First and foremost, to the people who did see it and comment, I can't thank you enough, especially to the person who suggested a, a plan on what to do in regards to the power. It was actually thanks to you that I was able to give the captain and the others a suggestion of what to do today. Unfortunately, due to the fact that we were so excited to get off the point of no return before she sank out from underneath us, we didn't bring the life raft with us. Only the supplies that we thought we'd need. We were too caught up in the fact that we had a better alternative to remember to lug it up the ladder. I do have to confess one thing to you all, though. When, when I first woke up this morning and, and checked the comments that you left, I thought people were either pulling my leg, thinking I was bullshitting you all, or that you'd been mistaken. I mean, after all, if, if the Queen Elizabeth caught fire and sank years, if not decades ago, how the hell could we be on board? Ghost ships, legitimate ones, only exist in horror movies, not in real life. There had to be a mistake made here. However, after some of the things that have happened today, I can't help but start to wonder if you're right. And if you are, we're in a whole lot bigger trouble than we thought. I'm jumping the gun, though. I, I should tell you what went down today. When I first woke up, the first thing I realized was that the storm had passed. The rain no longer pounded on the roof of the ship, and it no longer twisted about in the swells. For a moment, it was so calm I forgot where we were, what had happened yesterday. Then everything came crashing back to me, causing me to sit up straight in my sleeping bag. The first thing I saw was the captain, who sat in one of the lounge chairs. He must have woken up a while ago. His head turned in my direction as I pulled myself out of the bag to my feet, and he gave a short nod. Winding up my nerve around the sleeping forms of the others, I had made my way over to him. How long you been up, Cap? I whispered, as I picked up another chair and sat it beside him. He shrugged. A little while now. I was planning on waking everyone else up in twenty minutes or so. I could see that losing Kenny still weighed heavily on his shoulders. The man likely hadn't gotten much sleep due to it eating away at him. I decided to say something. You know what happened wasn't your fault, Gabe. Kenny was above us. We couldn't have done anything to save him. It was... It was just an accident. For a moment I saw his eyes harden and his mouth opened as if to snap at me. Then he slumped into the chair, his body seeming to sag. I appreciate you saying that, Nathan. More than you know. He sighed. But a captain's job is to keep his crew safe. Get them home. I didn't do that for Kenny. I'm going to have to live with that. I wanted to argue, but I saw that no amount of it would change his mind. Instead, I... I nodded and turned to look out across the massive room. We roused the others a few minutes later, and as they opened up the supplies we'd brought to bring out some food and water, the captain reminded me to check the laptop. Booting it up, I saw the battery was low, making a mental reminder to set the solar-powered charger and the sunlight outside to charge it back up. Then I checked the post I'd made. Hope and excitement surged through me as I saw comments left below. You, you guys, people saw what I wrote! I called out. In seconds, I was surrounded as everyone crowded around me. A bottle of water and a granola bar were shoved into my hands as I read the comments you all had left. There was silence for a few moments. Then Spencer spoke up. I, I can't be right, he said softly. He looked up at us. These people can't be right, right? There's no way the ship they're talking about is the same one we're on board. Wyatt answered him. No, Spence, they... Either think we're playing with them and just spewed bullshit, or they're thinking that uh, they're thinking of another ship. We're not on some early two thousands horror movie. I shot a look at the captain. Cap, you're the oldest out of all of us. I began. Do you know if there was a ship called the the Queen Elizabeth that did catch fire and sink? He stayed quiet for a moment, seemingly lost in thought, before answering. There was a ship called the Queen Elizabeth. 
It was built in 1930, and that did catch fire and sink in Hong Kong Harbor in the early 70s. He shook his head. No, there's no way this could be the same one. There are no such thing as ghost ships that manifest out of nothing. He stood up, seeming to push away any remaining thoughts of the matter from his head. We need to get on to more realistic and pressing matters, though. We need to find a way to get power going. Without it, we have no way to operate the radio to send out a call for help. I pointed at a particular comment that gave an idea of what to do. He leaned down, silently reading it before nodding. That's our plan for today, he declared, before splitting us up into two teams. One team comprised of myself, Andrew, Spencer, and Will, and we would explore as much of the ship as we could, while the captain, Wyatt, and the other remaining member of the crew, a tall, muscular Italian man named Vinny, would try to find their way down to the bowels of the ship to restore power. With the plan made, and a set of walkie-talkies given to the captain and to me to maintain contact with each other, we exchanged the last good luck and stay safe and left the lounge. Flicking on our flashlights, the four of us slowly walked back through the hallway that we'd taken to get inside. A moment later, we emerged into the bright light of day. The sun felt nice and warm on my face, and I couldn't help but let a small smile cross my face. It disappeared, though, as my eyes looked out beyond the railing. The endless ocean surrounded us, stretching far away beyond the horizon. No sign of land anywhere. A small shiver shot through me as the image of our ship slipping beneath the waves replayed in my mind, along with watching Kenny fall to his doom. I shook my head. Snap yourself out of it. Keep focused. I pulled the solar charger from my pocket and set it down next to the open hatch. I'd pick it up later when we came back this way. Andrew spoke up, pointing to the row of lifeboats that hung from davits that spread out away from us. You think those would be safe for us to use? I shrugged my shoulders. I don't see why not, but I wouldn't want to try and use one of those to get back to shore. I pushed the hair out of my eyes and pushed my glasses on my nose. All right. Let's keep moving, guys. For the next few hours, the four of us explored both the inside and outside of the ship, occasionally stopping to radio our position back to the captain. The Queen Elizabeth was indeed a luxury ship in every sense of the word. The wood on the outside decks were well varnished and teaked, shining brightly in the sunlight. The same was true for the miles of wood that plastered the walls of the carpeted hallways and the rooms that crisscrossed the inside like a maze. I was almost in awe of how beautiful it was. However, there was one thing that surprised me, and I wasn't the only one to notice. As we walked through another lounge, Will said the words that incessantly reverberated in my head. Anyone else notice we haven't seen a single TV on board yet? Andrew shrugged his shoulders. Hey, who knows? Maybe they took all the TVs off the walls for renovations or something. And maybe it's one of those ships that deliberately doesn't have any in order to keep the passengers from not taking part in activities. His words reassured me a little, but... I still couldn't help but feel a little uncomfortable. The entire time we'd been exploring the ship, an indescribable feeling was following me like an annoying dog. And to make matters worse, the feeling of being watched that I had had last night hadn't gone away. Every so often I would shoot a look behind us as we walked, aiming my light back the way we'd come. I saw nothing. But for some reason, it felt like something had been there and pulled back just out of sight every single time I looked. As we entered what, according to the sign above the door, was the first-class smoking room, the radio on my belt chirped. There was a layer of static above everything due to the massive amount of steel and wood in the way, but the words of the captain were unmistakable. Nathan, we finally reached the engine room. We also found the power source. I heard a small trace of surprise in the man's voice as he continued. You're not going to believe this, but, um... The ship's powered by what appears to be Yarrow boilers. I've seen these things on a ship since I was a young man in the Navy. Spencer's face scrunched up in confusion. The hell is a Yarrow boiler? He asked. I shrugged my shoulders, then hit the transmit button. 
Can you get the power going? There was another wave of static before he answered. It'll take a little while, but yes, you'll be able to get power back to the ship. Just give us about 20 minutes or so, half an hour at most. It's been a while since I've ever had to fire one of these behemoths up. There are 12 of them down here. And with that, he clicked off. Well, now what do we do in the meantime? Will asked. Spencer began to answer him. Well, I remember seeing on a map on the wall there was a first class gym on the deck. One of us could go lift some weights till everything was going up. Or, if you fancy a swim, there's a swimming pool as well. Hell, we could even. He kept speaking, but I stopped listening to him. The feeling of being watched had returned. This time with a vengeance that caused a cascade of shivers to shoot up my spine. For a moment, I resisted the urge to look around. Then I cast my eyes towards a set of windows to the outside. Where someone peered in at us. I only caught a glimpse of the figure for a moment before they realized they'd been spotted and yanked their head back out of sight. But it was enough to see what looked like a small boy or a young teenager. Hey! I shouted out, rushing over to the window. It didn't open, but I was able to crane my neck enough to look around the corner. The deck was empty in all directions, but I, I knew I hadn't seen things. There had been someone there. Hey guys, did any of you see that? There was no answer from behind me. I could imagine them looking at me like I'd just grown two heads. They'd probably think I'm nuts. Seriously, I'm not kidding. I saw someone out there. They still didn't respond. I felt a slight pang of irritation flow through me and turned back, beginning to speak. Guys, don't be assholes. I'm asking you a... The smoking room was empty. My voice died in my throat. And I felt a wave of confusion wash over me. What the hell? I looked around, my eyes wandering to the ornate wooden bar that lined the back of the room, but there was no movement over there either. But what the hell did... Did, did they freaking leave? I breathed out incredulously. The irritation I'd felt a moment ago reared its head again, and I strode to the open doors to the hallway. Hey, assholes, what the hell's the matter with you? We're not supposed to split up! My voice echoed in the gloom. Bouncing off the wooden walls, dying away. But nobody answered. A thought suddenly entered my mind. Oh, this better not be a fucking prank. This is not the time or the place for that shit. I knew that the three men loved to play practical jokes on themselves and the rest of the crew, but I would have thought they'd done better than to pull them in this predicament. I let out a deep sigh and began to walk down the hall, my footsteps muted by the carpeted floor. If this is a joke, I'll fucking wring your necks, I muttered, reaching a T-junction and shining my light down it. Empty. Empty and silent. I kept going straight, passing by a sign showing the direction of the gym and the movie theater. I remembered hearing Spencer talk about it and quickened my pace. I expected the sound of their voices to slowly begin filtering down to me, but as I approached the door to it, I still heard nothing. And when I shone the light inside, reflecting off rowing machines, stationary bikes, and other exercise equipment I didn't recognize, my exasperation grew. You know what? Screw this. I said through gritted teeth, snatching a walkie-talkie from my belt and thumbing it. Hey, Captain, you're not going to like this, but the others quite literally abandoned me and ran off to God knows where. I'm trying to find them, but they're completely fucked off. I, any advice on what I should do? Over. A wall of static greeted me as I let go of the transmit button. No one answered. I hit the button again. Captain, do you read me? I'm alone. The others have run off. Over. More static. I began to fiddle with the dials, changing channels. Fucking interference, stupid piece of shit. I hit the button again. Hello, does anybody read me? Over. 
the static suddenly stopped. The hallway went silent. A silence I've never experienced before, one that seemed to be alive, if that makes any sense. Then a voice suddenly tumbled from a walkie-talkie speaker. Hello, Nathan. My eyes shot down to the radio in my hand, my breathing catching in my throat. It felt like someone had just poured a bucket of ice water down my back. That, that wasn't the captain's voice. That wasn't any of my crewmates' voices. For a moment, I debated saying nothing, and then I... Then I slowly pressed down on the transmit button. My throat had gone dry as cotton. Hello? I said, my voice coming out gaspy and ragged. For a few seconds, there was no reply, and then... Then came the voice again. A man's voice, deep and low. Welcome aboard. To all of you. My heart began to thump hard in my chest, and my breathing quickened. What the actual fuck, man? I forced myself to hit the button again, forced my voice to come out much calmer than I felt. Who the hell are you? There was another stretch of silence in which I began to furiously look over my shoulders, the feeling of paranoia growing by the second. Then my blood turned to ice as a new sound emanated from the radio speaker. The sound of the man beginning to laugh. Another laugh joined the first, this time a woman. I stared at the radio as if it was possessed, as more and more people's laughter began to filter out of it, sounding as if an entire room full of people had just found what I'd said the most hilarious thing they'd ever heard. Fear began to fill every fiber of my being, a, a new kind of fear, different than the one I'd felt in the storm last night, and then and it climaxed as a horrifying scream, one that sounded like a woman being brutally murdered, tore from the speakers. I practically flung the walkie-talkie out of my hand to the floor, clapping a hand over my mouth as I backed up into the wall. As soon as the scream finished, the radio went silent. For a few moments, I stood there, hands still clapped over my mouth and staring at the radio like like it was about to sprout legs and chase after me. I fought to get my racing heart and stuttering breaths under control, the logical part of my mind trying to make sense of things. You're panicking, Nathan. You're, you're panicking, and you're, you're panicking so much that you're, you're beginning to experience auditory hallucinations. When the mind breaks, it conjures up things that aren't there. What, what you need to do is get outside into the fresh air. Fresh air will do you good took a deep breath, feeling myself begin to calm down. The fear I'd felt began to melt away like ice in spring, and I, I shook my head. Yeah, you're supposed to be the calm and rational type, Rogers, I whispered to myself. I let out a soft laugh and took a step towards my dropped radio, but I stopped as I felt my footstep on something. Something that wasn't carpet. I looked down at the floor. There, crushed under my foot was what appeared to be a folder of some sort. No, not a folder. I crouched down aiming my light as I picked up the object. There was artwork on the cover. I, I could see a violin, a, a film reel, shuffleboard, other items decorating the cover. Big blocky black letters in the middle of the cover read program for today. And in the bottom right hand corner was the word Kernert in cursive scrawl. I looked at the cover as I walked over and picked the radio up, clipping it back to my belt. Focusing my attention on it was helping me rapidly calm, and I decided to quickly flip it open to see what it said. There were only two pages inside. The top of the left page was adorned with the words notices, while the right page was headlined with program of events. My eyes began to slide down them, silently reading it out until my mind caught up with my eyes. Wait, wait I, I didn't just see that, did I? I flashed the light back up to the top of the right page, where the date was stamped. Thursday, June 21st, 1956. What? I blinked my eyes a couple of times, silently praying that the date would change. 
that I was seeing things. But no. It remained the same. I, I began to feel my heart pound in my chest again. This, this makes no fucking sense, man, I said. For a moment, my mind flashed back to the comment I'd seen this morning about... about the ship having sunk decades ago. I shook my head, trying to stay calm. Get the hell outside, Nathan. Take a, take a breath. I turned my head back to the direction of the smoking room and... froze. The program fell from my hand to the floor. My heart thundered in my chest and my breathing came in short, ragged gasps. There were figures standing in the hallway, down by the T-junction. I, I, I couldn't tell how many, but there were enough that they blocked the way back. In the gloom, I couldn't see any features, just the dark outlines of them. Remembering the flashlight in my hand, I began to raise it to aim at them. And that's when the light flickered out. I was plunged into gloom as I stared down at the light, smacking it and mentally pleading for it to come back to life, but it was no use. The light was dead. Realization suddenly filled me as my mind screamed at me that I'd taken my eyes away from the figures. When I snapped my head up, I almost screamed. They'd, they'd drawn closer, packing the hallway from wall to wall. They, they made no noise. At first... And then I heard the whispering again. It started quietly, almost, almost to the point that I thought that I was hearing things, but then it began to grow louder. I, I couldn't tell what was being said. The voices were so low, it was impossible to distinguish individual words. Even so, I, I felt a new bolt of terror shoot through me at the sound, and then my fear compounded as I saw the figures take a step towards me. I began to violently shake as I slowly began to back away. And then they came for me. The figures were suddenly a blur of motion, moving far faster than any human being could. They streamed towards me, the whispering suddenly intensifying to a fever pitch. Caught off guard, I stumbled backwards, tripping over my own feet and falling to the floor. My right elbow slammed into the wood paneling and I felt a bolt of pain shoot up my arm. The figures swarmed over me. The whispering morphed into laughter. Laughter and screaming. A moment later, more screaming began. My screams. And I raised my arms over my head, covering my face and curling into a ball. Tears began to roll down my face. I, I, I felt at any moment I'd be torn apart. Nathan! The shout cut through the silence. I stopped screaming. I kept my arms over my head protectively. Then I felt a hand begin to roughly shake me. The terror returned and I lashed out. Get the fuck off of me! I screamed. The voice came again, a familiar voice. Hey, easy, easy, bro, easy. The realization made me lower my arms and open my eyes. Three faces etched with panic and fear looked down at me. For a second, I, I fought to find my voice. Andrew, Will, Spence. Relief crossed the face of my crewmates. He's back, Andrew said quietly, wiping visible sweat from his brow. I uncurled myself and sat up, looking around. I was lying on the floor of the smoking room, close to the window, the one that I'd seen the figure outside. I was lying on the floor of the smoking room, close to the window I'd seen the figure outside. Sunlight still streamed in, landing on where I collapsed on the floor. I looked up at the others. What? What the hell happened? I managed to ask. Spencer shook his head, still looking rattled, but Andrew again answered me. Dude, I have no fucking idea. One minute we were talking about going to check out other areas of the ship, the next you suddenly yelled and ran to the window. Then you started pulling a statue routine. You didn't respond to anything we said. You just stared out at the ocean, not moving, not blinking, until you suddenly fell to the floor and began screaming. He let out a shaky breath of his own. He scared the ever-living shit out of us. I blinked rapidly. My mind trying to make sense of his words had, had I really hallucinated everything? 
had it all just been in my head? I stumbled to my feet, aided by Will and Spence. Andrew just kept looking at me, a concerned look now on his face. I took a deep breath of my own. I'm, I'm okay, I said, my voice sounding far calmer and sure than I felt. You sure? Will asked me. I nodded. I must have gotten less sleep last night than I thought. The stress and the sleep must have made me... Uh, I, I don't know, fall asleep standing up or something. I, I could see the other two relax immediately. Taking my words at face value, but Andrew continued to look at me for a moment, seemingly unconvinced. Finally, he nodded. The sound of static stabbed through the air, causing me to almost jump out of my skin. Then the sound of the captain's voice rang out from the radio on my belt. We're in business, boys! I heard him declare happily. A moment later, I felt the floor beneath my feet shudder slightly from what must have been the boilers coming to life. And then the lights came on, all throughout the ship. The smoking room became ablaze with the yellow light of what had to be incandescent bulbs, banishing away the gloom that lurked in the corners like monsters in the closet. I began to say something to the others when a new sound began. Music. Music began spilling out from what had been hidden speakers in the walls or ceiling. It echoed all throughout the deck. I, I could hear the instruments along with the woman's crooning voice reverberating far down the hallway. And likely throughout the entire ship as well. Spencer looked up at the walls. That's one hell of an old song, he commented. Andrew nodded, still looking hard at me. Will suddenly snapped his fingers. I know this song, he exclaimed. M my grandmother used to play it all the time when I was a little kid. He began snapping his fingers again, thinking hard. It's uh, it's by a, a singer from the 40s and 50s called, I think, uh, jo jo Joe Stafford? Now Andrew did take his eyes off me, looking over at him. What's the song's name? he asked, mildly interested. Will thought for another moment before answering. You belong to me. As if on cue, the singing voice sang out the four words. I couldn't help but shiver slightly at them, still feeling as if I'd jumped straight from Kansas to Oz and then been booted back to reality. I cleared my throat. Um. Hey guys, would you mind not telling the captain about what happened to me? He looked at me for a moment, thinking. Yeah, yeah, sure, Nate. Andrew said. As long as you don't ever do that again. <laughs> Feeling relieved, I nodded. Spencer spoke up. Come on, we should try and make it back up with the captain. Figure out what to do next. And with that, we walked out of the room, Will following close after him. Andrew shot me one more look. You sure you're all right? He asked. I nodded. Yeah, I'm fine. I lied. I raised my right arm to rub the back of my neck as he began to leave the room, but I stopped as a throbbing pain suddenly shot up my arm. I let out a small gasp of pain, bringing my left hand over to feel the back. As soon as my fingers touched my right elbow, another sear of pain rippled out. I turned and looked where I'd fallen. There was nothing there for me to have slammed my elbow into. And the carpet had been thick and plush. Too plush to have hurt myself. The mental image of falling back into the wall suddenly burst forth in my mind. Falling as those... those... figures rushed towards me. Whispering and laughing and screaming. My eyes slowly rose to look down at the now brightly lit hallway. Even from here, I could see the sign showing the location of the gym. I shuddered. It was just a hallucination. Wasn't it? I swallowed hard, forcing the thought from my head, and hurried to catch up to the others. We met the captain and the others back in the lounge we'd spend the night in. 
They'd found a way to turn the music off, and for that I was thankful. All we'd heard as we walked through the ship had been songs that sounded like they were from 70 years ago or older. All they did was remind me of the program I'd clutched in my hand. We met the captain and the others back in the lounge we'd spend the night in. They'd found a way to turn the music off, and for that I was thankful. All we'd heard as we walked through the ship had been songs that sounded like they were from 70 years ago or older. All they did was remind me of the program I'd clutched in my hand, seeing the date on it. We could tell they must have been breaking their backs to get the boilers going, sweat and black stains covering their faces and clothes. The captain glanced down at his watch. We only have about an hour or so of daylight left. Let's try and make our way to the radio room, see if we can send out a distress call. After that, we'll figure out where to go from there. We all nodded and hurried after the man as he led the way. The radio room wasn't hard to find at all. Once we'd entered the upper levels of the ship, ones I could tell were meant for crew only, the signs led us right to it. My hopes at being able to get off rose with every step we took, and then they were dashed as we reached the closed door to it. The captain reached out and attempted to turn the handle, but it refused to turn. A few of us gathered up next to him and attempted to force it open, but it wouldn't budge a single inch. Damn it! Locked! The captain growled as we finally gave up. I felt my heart sink. I could see the same expression in everyone else's face, but then... Then the captain continued. All right. That means there's got to be a set of keys somewhere on board that can get us in there. He rapped on the metal door with his knuckles. So our next job is to find them. They'll likely be in the crew's sleeping quarters. Maybe even in the captain's cabin. He looked at his watch again. But that'll be a job for tomorrow. We should head back to the lounge, get some food and water into our systems, get some sleep. We've done a good job today. Finding our way through the ship now, she's had power, is going to be much easier. I felt equal parts dismay and anxiety as I followed the others back to the lounge. And as much as I tried to ignore it, I still felt watched. The lights didn't help one bit. I kept looking back over my shoulder, afraid I would see the boy I had seen in the smoking room window again. Or worse, the shadowy figures. Thankfully, though, I never did, and we made it uneventfully back to the lounge where we ate our dinner. Packages of MREs, ones that had been part of our emergency supplies. And then we began to settle back down for the night. I used the solar charger I'd left outside all day to charge the laptop. As I booted it up, Will came over to me. You truly all right, man? He quietly asked me. I nodded at him, giving him a false smile. He sighed. You know, as much of a fucked up situation as we're in, the one good part was hearing that song again. I haven't heard it since my grandmother passed away. I looked up at him. You like that kind of music? I asked. He nodded. Honestly, I like everything about that time period. The 1950s. I mean, I like the music, the movies, celebrities, cars. Between you and me, bro, I like it a hell of a lot more than the 21st century. If they invented time travel in my lifetime, I'd go back there in a heartbeat. Never come back. He let out a soft laugh, then patted me on the shoulder and walked away to his sleeping bag. I watched him go, then looked over at the captain. He gazed around at everyone, then looked over at me, and I started slightly. I saw something in his eyes that I wasn't used to seeing. Worry and fear? Did he see something down in the engine room? Just as quickly, it washed away, and he nodded at me. I returned the gesture, and he pointed at the laptop in my lap. It was an unspoken question. Are you going to try to send a message out again? I nodded, and he stood up, stretching his arms over his head and yawning before shaking his head slightly and heading for his own sleeping bag. And now, here I am. The only one left awake again. 
captain turned out most of the lights in the lounge, something I really didn't like. So I moved over to a table that remained upright, one that had a lamp built into the middle of it, and I turned it on. I now sit here typing this out, but I can't help but look up, my eyes darting around the dark, expansive room. I'm terrified every time I take my eyes off the screen that I'll see those figures again, standing in the dark, staring at me. I wish so much that we could just jump into one of those lifeboats on the side of the ship, lower it into the sea, and row away from this godforsaken place as fast as we could, but with only about a week and a half's worth of food and supplies, no idea where we are, we could end up rowing directly into the middle of the Atlantic, if we're not there already. Like I said at the start, when I, when I first started this day, I felt for sure you all had been wrong. But just because the ship is named the Queen Elizabeth, it didn't mean that it was the same one that caught fire and sank long ago, but... After what I saw in that hallway, both that program from 1956 and those... those things... Things that I truly don't know whether I hallucinated or not. I'm, I'm starting to believe you might be right. As much as my logical mind tries to tell me it's impossible, I think that we might have jumped out of the frying pan of our sinking ship and into the literal fire. And honestly, I'm beyond terrified. I have no idea how I'm going to sleep tonight. I think in the morning I'll see about getting myself some kind of weapon, a chair leg, a knife, something. I may not do anything against a kind of ghost, I guess, but I, it might make me feel better at least. But please, if you're still there, if you end up reading this, please let me know what we should do tomorrow. Should we, should we try and find the keys to the radio room like the captain suggests, or should we do something else? Is there anything that... I might have been missing here. Does anyone know anything more about the Queen Elizabeth? Anything that might might give me a clue as to why this is happening or just to direct us to any important places? Anything, anything you can think of might help us. And God knows. Right now, we need all the help we can get. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy base things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, and the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepypasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sullyman, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.